It's so rude of me. You were trying to serve me and I'm speaking on service. Shape to make a difference. Uh, week two, time for a change. Do you ever feel like it's time for a change? Like when you have a $2,000 car, praise God, and anyone have a $2,000 car and then you, you go to get your air conditioning done or you go to get something fixed and the mechanic says, hey, good news, we can fix it. It's going to cost you $3,000. And, and that's when you realize, okay, I think it's time for a change. Amen? Uh, what about <clears throat> when someone's dropped popcorn on the floor and you whip out the old vacuum cleaner and it's old because you've been persisting with it for generations and you, you vacuum it for about 10 minutes, the one spot, and that popcorn doesn't come up. Does anyone know what I'm saying? Like, just those stupid, it's like they can jolly well lift up a bowling ball, but they can't get, they can't get just stuff off the floor or lint or whatever. And it's like, well, what good is it if you can suck a bowling ball, but you can't get jolly popcorn? Are you with me? Okay, thank you. It's not just me. And then you realize, and then you start physically picking up the popcorn by hand, piece by piece. Has anyone ever done that? Yeah. And then you're sure, okay, that's when you realize you have to go and, get a vacuum cleaner and you think I really should get a good one that can pick up popcorn but instead you go to Kmart and you get a $30 one. <laughs> All right. It's time to make a change and when we're talking about service I think for some of us it, it may be a change of attitude or a change of approach or a change of appreciation for our service roles. You see for some of us uh, as we're talking about change it might not be appropriate for us to change. Some of you, you're called into professions, into vocations where God has planted you for a season. You might be a teacher. You might be a business person. You might be a carer of children or a carer of, um, of adults that can't look after themselves. And there's intrinsic dignity to what you're doing. And actually for this season, you're called to stay planted where you are. Um, so this idea of change might not be relevant for you, but there might be a change of approach, a change of attitude, a change of an awareness of the fact that God wants to use you to, um, to flourish and to grow in your area of service. It's very easy for someone like myself to talk about service and to, to talk about all the areas of the church where we want people to serve, but ultimately God has shaped you as a human being 24-7 to make a difference in this world. And a very small portion of that is through the local church. And Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, he gave us the blueprint of service. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so when we talk about service, we talk about um, how we live at home, how we live at work, how we live uh, in the in-between, and how we express ourselves in our local church as well. And so for some of us, it's, it's a change in attitude. For some of us, we've taken a step back and we haven't actually been serving God. Um, we've really been on the back burner. We've taken a season back and God would have us um, say, you know what? I'm ready to step up and start serving God with my gifts and my talents and my abilities and using my experiences so that I can make a, a contribution in this world in accordance with how God has made me. For some of us, we're just serving in an area where we're not firing. We're serving but we're, and, and we're, we're giving of ourselves, but we are not being as effective as God would have us to be. And so maybe that will be, there'll be something for you today. You weren't just created to consume resources, to eat and to breathe and to take up space. I love the fact in the Genesis um, narrative, you see Adam and Eve commissioned to take care of the creation. But they weren't just commissioned to, to look after it. You know, it was, wasn't like, um, they weren't called just to take care of it, but they were also called to um, extend the glory of Eden beyond the walls of Eden. There was this sense that God, the God who brings order out of chaos called Adam and Eve to bring order out of chaos, to name the animals and to actually create as being made in God's image. They were called to create as well. They were called to develop. And so, uh, and so as human beings, we are called not just to consume, but to create, to contribute, not just to take up space. And that's been part of our created mandate from word go. God designed you to make a difference, to add to life on the earth, not just to take from it. That you actually, wherever you see in this world decay, 
where you, wherever you see chaos, wherever you see life that's diminished, you as a man or woman of God have the opportunity to bring life. So um, when you serve, you are actually bringing life. Um, service and ministry in the New Testament are interchangeable words. So when you serve someone or when you minister to someone, it can be the same thing. And so how do we minister? How do we serve? It's when we bring life to death. Wherever you see death, wherever you see chaos, wherever you see decay in this world, what does it mean to be a servant? It's to say, I have a word of life. I have a contribution in my body, in my presence that can bring life to this situation. And you might not be able to change the situation, but you can be light in that situation. That is what it means to be a servant in the image of the God that came to serve. I love this scripture in Jeremiah and it says this and it's true for him and it's true for you. Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. Your conception might not have been purposed. Your conception might not have been strategic, but God chose you strategically from before you were born and within your mother's womb. And you have been set apart. I wonder if so much of our desire to serve, desire to find a vocation, desire to find a fit, what am I put on this planet to do? I wonder if rather than searching for a place where we can feel like I have found my home, I have found my place, I have found my niche, I wonder if we start with this perspective that I am set apart for a special work. I don't have to find the special work, I am already set apart. And that God has already distinguished me from amongst all of the other creatures in this world. I love Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, when we talk about service, when we talk about serving God and ministering on God for God, it's easy to get into the habit of talking about all the things that we do for God. I'm going to, you know, serve in the kids' ministry for God, or I'm going to uh, serve my family for God, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And it can become a shopping list that we have to tick off to attain godliness, to attain, okay, I jumped through those hoops and therefore I am a good Christian. I think the New Testament pattern is a little bit different to that because the New Testament talks about us being in Christ, a new creation. Galatians 2.20 says that we are co-crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but Christ lives within us. And so when we minister, we are outworking the continuing ministry of Jesus. Um, Some scholars, and actually New Testament word, there's there's a Greek word koinonia, And one way of translating that is participation. And we can actually participate with the ongoing ministry of Jesus. What does it mean to uh, participate with the ongoing ministry of Jesus? It means that Jesus, his life and his death and his resurrection, that's the finished work of the cross. But Jesus is continuing his mission and his ministry through you and I. And so rather than saying, what are all the things I can do for Jesus? Because... What if we said this, because I am in Christ and Christ is in me, how do I now live differently? Because Jesus lives in me, my natural life will reflect his mission and his ministry. And so it becomes less of a striving and less of an outworking of our new identity. It's like when if someone gets married and, and you put a ring on someone's finger and they go on a honeymoon, but it's very easy. You still feel like a single person because you've been a single person for the majority of your life. But over a period of time, there's a new sense of identity that I am no longer a single person. I'm a married person. Our new identity in Christ, it should over time seep out of us so that ministry becomes not something we do, but an expression of our new identity as children of God. What did that scripture say? We're God's masterpiece. We're God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You know, I think a lot of us spend our lives, when we're talking about service, you might think, oh man, am I called to be a preacher? Am I called to be a doctor? Am I called to be a business person? Am I called to serve the poor and the needy, to give up everything and go and work in a social justice, a parachurch organisation? Am I called to... Um, be a full-time carer? Am I called to do this? And we, we think about the good works that we have to do, but the scripture clearly says because of our new identity in Christ, because we already are God's workmanship, there's good works for us to do. 
It's not like maybe one day you will find the magic trail of good works. Maybe one day if you make the right educational choices or you make the right wise choices or the right relational choices when you're 16, when you're 22, when you're 25, one day by a magical occurrence when you're 33, you will find this, this magical path of good works. And I just got this picture of one of those old school, when I say old school, I mean 1990s um, video games where you like got Alex the Kid or whatever and, and he's walking along and he just finds this path with all like these good treasures to get. And it's like sometimes we think I've got to find all the treasures. But the scripture says that these good works that God has set apart for you, all you need to do is to walk in them. What it's saying is in your everyday life, as you go about your life, there are going to be opportunities to serve God. There are going to be opportunities to do good works and the good works that are around you today will be different to the good works available in 10 years time. But you know what doesn't change? The fact that you're set apart and you're God's workmanship. I think it's really important to get our foundations right. You know, some people think about special work. They think about pastors, priests, and professional clergy. Let me tell you, there's nothing more spiritual or special about professional ministers of the gospel that get paid to be pastors or leaders and you where you're called because God forbid that we all are called to the same thing. I know my friend uh, Mike Hardy, he, his dad was a paramedic for many years, saved hundreds of lives. And he always used to say to his son, son, you've got a higher calling than me. And some people, it doesn't matter how many times they hear it, they believe it. They believe that there are certain things in life that have more intrinsic value. Let me tell you that God does not see you that way. Let me tell you that God does not value the way man values I was reflecting on this quote recently and reflecting on how much I disagree with it. It's attributed to either Mark Twain or Confucius. So when you're taking notes, you can write either of those. Choose a job you enjoy doing and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Oh, doesn't that sound good? So like, you know, 17-year-olds come and see me, they're in year 12. Hey, what should I do with the rest of my life? Just, just tell me if you could do anything in the world. If money wasn't an issue and, and employment wasn't an issue, what would you do for the rest of your life? I'd like to play video games. Well, you know what? Why don't you turn that into a job and then you'll never have to work for a day in your life? What rhubarb? You see, I was here for a, for a I think it was a graduation for year seven last year, one of the local schools that will remain nameless. And the predominant jobs that kids wanted to do when they grew up, I think, what, what would they be, 12? The two most were, when I grow up, I want to be a pro sports person. It's like, okay, great. Like, we've got a few, we've got a few professional sports people in the church here. Like, God bless you. That's fantastic. But how many people know that not everyone that wants to be a pro sports person ends up being a pro sports person, okay? And it's like, and by the way, I'm, I, Steve Smith used to play for my local cricket club. I'm just throwing that out there, just name dropping. I walked past him in the shops once. He just scored 178 or whatever. Pretty good batsman. Um, but, <laughs> but they want to be a pro sports person. The other thing they wanted to be was a professional YouTuber. <laughs> Some of you don't even know what that is. Like, in the world, there's such a small amount, a small percentage of people, all the people that are school teachers, this is not news to you, is it? Like, the kids actually think, when I grow up, I want to be able to sit on my laptop and just make YouTube videos of me just talking to the camera, and I'm going to make millions of dollars. Like, there is probably a handful of people in the world that make millions of dollars from YouTube videos, and there's probably millions of people trying to make millions of dollars, and they make nothing. What I believe is that I believe even if you're Tiger Woods and you've got an incredible gift for golf, no matter what you do in this life, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of pain. It's going to take a lot of guts. And so the question is not how do you find your perfect job? Because some of you, you're waiting off for your perfect job. You're waiting for that perfect break before you start giving it your best. But that may never come. What if, as men and women of God, we said this? that we wanted to be men and women that see our vocation, our job, our ministry, our service area, and even our menial tasks as opportunities to serve. Because you see, Jesus, God in the flesh, He spent the majority of His life not in professional ministry. 
He spent 30 years at home with his mum. His primary roles was being a son, was being a brother, and was being a carpenter. There's intrinsic dignity in being a carpenter, a son, and a brother. And you see, if we spend our whole life saying, I'm waiting for this big break before I give it my best, I'm going to wait to serve until this happens, then we will miss out on the preparation for maybe that big break or maybe that change of season that will come. You see, Jesus, in those 30 years, he learned what it meant to be a man full of the Spirit. He learned what it meant to, meant to be a man that loved his mother and served his mother. He learned what it meant to serve his community and do what he does with excellence as being a carpenter. You see, I believe that Jesus spent so many of those years studying the Hebrew Scriptures so that when he launched out at age 30, the, the Word of God was burning like fire within him and he could outquote the devil with the Bible. You see, um, we need to make sure that not just our ideal job, but our current job, our ministry, our menial tasks and our vocation, and, and, and even just the things that we're doing that we don't want to do, we see them as opportunities to serve because Jesus came to serve us. So how should we be different when we serve? The first, th- first thing is this, we should be different in who we serve, who we serve. So many of us, we say we serve God, but we really are serving a person or we're really serving our self-interest or we're really serving our paycheck. Ephesians 6 verse 7 says this, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. You see, when I was a kid working at McDonald's, I I was looking for a fellow Christian because I was, I started at 14 and nine months. I felt like a a lamb amongst the wolves, and there was all these older kids talking about drinking and girls and nightclubs, three things I had very little knowledge about, particularly the girls thing and the nightclubs and the drinking. Um, and, and I was kind of looking for an ally Christian in my workplace, and I finally heard that one of these people that I was working with was a Christian. And I was really disappointed to learn that he was the biggest slacker in all of McDonald's. I mean, that guy whinged for a living, and when he wasn't whinging, he was whinging about whinging. He hated working at McDonald's. He hated everything. He gave the worst effort, and I was so disappointed when I found out he was a Christian. Um, Well, actually, that's probably the wrong way of putting it. Um, But then I met him in another context around his Christian friends, and it was at a youth leaders meeting. And it was like a different person. He was like beaming off. He was like excited. He's like, hey, Tim, good to see you. And, and all of his friends were like, yeah, yeah, I know you know him. He's an awesome guy and he's such a great leader in our church. I'm thinking, great leader in your church? You should see him at McDonald's. And you see, sometimes we can be super spiritual at church. Oh, yes, when I'm, when I'm uh, doing this at church, I'm doing it unto God. But we, our attitude can really be, we can have, be super spiritual at church and we can be super slack in other areas of our lives. And so who we serve matters. So when you're a a mum, you're not ultimately just serving your kids, you're serving God in the way you serve your kids. When you're a dad, when you're looking after your kids, you're not ultimately just looking after your kids first, you're also serving God. So who we serve matters. Number two, why we serve God and others should be different. Why we serve matters. Um, Hebrews 9.14, how much more would the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see, I believe that most, many of us, we serve out of dead works. What does that mean? It means we serve to feel less dead. It means that we serve to make ourselves feel better in the presence of God. We serve so we feel like we have more value. But that's dead works. That's self-righteousness, trying to be righteous. And God says that's dead works. If you're just striving to be a better person, um, but it's not out of a foundation of the finished work of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus, it's dead works. It doesn't actually make God more impressed with us. And so dead works lead to just disappointment. They don't lead to fruitfulness. And so if we're just striving and just doing stuff, trying to be better Christians, trying to, tr- trying to make our identity in this world, um, then it doesn't actually bring life. You see, uh, one psychologist, Dr. What's his first name? I can't remember his first name. Dr. Stevens. He wrote a book called Mirror Mirror on narcissism. And the book is basically about even the good things that many of us do for other people 
it's not about helping other people. It's about us making ourselves feel better about ourselves. And so narcissists aren't just people like a few of you in this room that wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, thank God that he made me just the way I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord for this body and this face. <clears throat> but for some of us, it's, some of us are martyrs. Some of us are rescuers. We derive our identity from rescuing other people that are in pain and we feel like we are their Lord and Saviour. We, the, the world will fall apart if I wasn't there to plug all the gaps. Oh, you know, the, 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 that we are the martyr, that we are the one that everything bad happens to and we take all the bullets for other people. But it's not actually out of our generosity of our hearts that we're a martyr. It's that it actually makes us feel like we're more important. It makes us feel like we're holier. And we have to make sure that we serve God out of freedom, not out of dead works. So we, we are set free through the work of the cross so that we may what? It says in Hebrews 9.14, serve or minister. To the, uh, so we can serve and minister. We can serve the living God. Actually, I think the other word is serve and worship the living God in the other translation. Um, and so we are, we are to serve out of freedom. Never let anyone force you into serving. doesn't mean people won't challenge you into serving. Hey, I'm going to challenge you into serving. But when we come to the point of saying yes, we should do it out of freedom, saying I am choosing to serve because Christ lives in me and I want to live in accordance with my new identity in Christ because I love people or I want to help. Sometimes it's just there's dignity in saying I'm going to serve because I want to help that person. You understand that? It's like, oh, oh, you know what? I really don't want to do this, but I really feel like God has called that person. They need help. And so I'm going to give them six months or a year. I'm going to serve that person because I believe God's called that person. And I'm going to serve them and I'm going to serve God in the midst of it, even though I'm not passionate about that ministry. Do you know what I mean? Because if we, if we always wait for the passion, sometimes we miss opportunities left, right and center. And where we serve matters. But I think where we serve matters far less than who and why we serve. Just like the example of Jesus, whether he was a carpenter or whether he was out preaching and healing the sick, he was all the same man and it was a different season of ministry for him. I believe in life you can waste seasons, you can live the season or you can invest in the season. And so for some of us, I think the changing of the season is that we need to recalibrate our service. So we're not just serving, we're not just going through the motions, but we're actually investing our lives in the way that will produce the best benefit for us, the best benefit for other people, and we'll bring glory to God because we're tuning in to what He wants for us. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by finding our shape, our spiritual shape, the way God has uniquely framed us. And shape is an acronym which we're going to look at now. S stands for spiritual gifts. What God has supernaturally gifted me to do. H is heart. What do I have a passion to do? Abilities. What natural talents and skills do I have? Personality. Where does my personality best suit me to serve? And experiences. What experiences have I had? Rick Warren says this, your ministry will be most effective and fulfilling when you're using your gifts and abilities in the area of your heart's desire in the way that best expresses your personality and experience. So, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are gifts that, are, that the, the Holy Spirit of God gives to us. Sometimes they illuminate natural gifts that we have, but they are given from the Spirit, and they are diverse. Some of, them are, some of them seem spectacular, and some of them seem really practical. How do we discover our spiritual gifts? Well, I believe that it's easy to discover your spiritual gifts through ministry and service through discovering your ministry through your gift. Sometimes we can navel-gaze a lot. We can say, well, what is... What are all my gifts? What is, what is my unique contribution to make? And your spiritual gift might be the interpretation of tongues, okay? Okay, well, good luck with that, expressing that in everyday life. There's only one way you're going to actually be able to outwork that gift, and that might be in a ministry expression. There might be, you, you might read something on a piece of paper about leadership. You might do, you might do a survey 
and, and you might find out your spiritual, top spiritual gift is leadership, but you have, haven't got much experience in leadership. So the best way to discover spiritual gifts, gifts is in the midst of serving and ministering and finding out and discovering what's already there. But there is value in doing an assessment, an online assessment, just to find out how God has uniquely gifted you. And one of the ways we're going to make this available to the church is just by going to this website, familycenter.org.au forward slash resources forward slash shape. And on there, you'll be able to click on a link to an online spiritual gift survey. I found the shortest one possible, but some of them go for 150 questions. And I know you lot. Some of you look at it and be like, eh, I don't think so. Um, so I found one that's uh, pretty accessible. You put your email address down the bottom and just un on that website, there's actually information about where you send your completed surveys to. And uh, we'll send them through to Pastor Janet Bryce. And we as a team, what we'll do is we'll allocate, we'll allocate ministry leaders and pastors right across our church. If you want to say, hey, you know what? I'd love to talk to someone about my shape. I'd love to talk to someone about my spiritual gifts and my abilities and my personality and how I can serve in a more effective way. And we will um, line up an appointment with you with a ministry director or a ministry leader or a pastor or a leader in the church to have a sit-down conversation with you and go through your survey results, okay? So that's an opportunity for anyone here. It's not going to be for everyone, but there might be some people that say, I'd love to sit down and talk to someone so I can serve in a way that's going to have the most benefit for the church and also that I can be true to who God's shaped me to be. So make sure you get that down, folks. I'll, we might send out an email during the week with that as well. H is for heart. Psalm 37 verse 4 says this, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Another way to think of your heart is to think about your passion. What drives you? What would you do for God if you couldn't fail? What pushes you to action? Where do you feel like you can have the most influence? Is there an age range or a demographic that you just feel drawn to? Is there an affinity group or a people group or a, a, a nationality or whatever, minority in our city that you feel drawn to? Are there certain needs that you feel drawn to? Are there things that keep you up at night? Are there issues that make your heart race? Are there things that you're really passionate about? Are there areas where you feel like you can have a great impact for the kingdom of God? God really does care about your heart, the things that light the fire of your heart. And if we were, when we have a sit-down conversation, that's the kind of thing that we would say. What are the things that you're passionate about? Not just what are the things that you can do. What are the things that you're passionate about? Ab abilities is the next one. Um, I, I would add another A with abilities. I think availability is just as important as ability. Um, I was just looking up here. You know, one, one person that... Of, I don't know why I was thinking about you, Todd, but I remember you when you were first learning guitar, when, you know, as a kid in youth. And it's amazing how many abilities can develop over time. And we often look at people and we say, oh, well, they're just gifted or they can just do that. But you know what? So many people in this church and in our community have abilities because they've worked at something. And now Todd's able to use his abilities to bless people. Thank you, Todd. And there are some people in this room that you could have that ability, you just haven't invested into that ability. And that's what I, but, but ability, here's the other thing. Some of the most able people are some of the most unavailable people. And I don't say that to make people feel guilty because for some people you want to serve, but you can't in this season and that's okay. Don't let any person make you feel guilty if you're just unable to serve in the way you would like for a season. That's fine. You have to do what God's called you to do and you have to, and you have to, face the realities of, and the complexities of your life. But for some of us, we have abilities that are being hindered by our lack of availability because we have not created enough space to use our abilities to help others. P is personality. Understanding the personality God has given you to help you um, more effectively express your gifts, heart, abilities for his sake. Um, you know, isn't it great that in this room we have so many different personalities? It's just so good. I, uh, Pastor Bill often says that, you know, your character should change, but unfortunately for most of us, our personalities will never change. And some of us that have young children, we just shudder at the thought of our kids' personalities never changing. <laughs> but we kind of like it as well. And uh, 
I love Lee. I I love your your you've got a passionate personality, and 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 I know the things. There's certain things I know. If I'm preaching, there's certain things I can say, and it'll light your fire. You know, I'm just going to hear some amens from Lee, and 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 we need to just identify and learn to love our personality. We have to we have to just stop resenting our personality. Oh no, why am I like this? Grow in your character, but realize that your personality has been given to you by God. And as you grow in character, he's actually made you that way for a reason. How are you energized? I've shared this before, but Pastor Bill, he can have a three-day meeting, like from morning till night. There can be uh, conversation, conflict, like heavy stuff, all these sorts of things. And he'll come out of it. And every time, how's the meetings? Oh, great. He's always positive. And he's just beaming and he, he's sending emails and he, he's, he's, he's on a high. He could do it all again. He go, he, and sometimes he said, I could do it again. I could go for another day. If I had three days of high-end meetings, I would want to just put me in the fetal position, put some sport on so I don't have to engage with life for a period of time. Can I please have like a straw attached to my mouth so I can drink something? And that's just part of the way I am. So how are you energized? How are you organized? How do you tick at your best? All right? An experience. An experience. Take a moment to think about these different experiences and how they've impacted your life. Spiritual experiences. Meaningful decisions. Times with God. Times you've, you've felt close to God. Times where, where you felt an absence of God's presence. Painful experiences, problems, hurts, trials, tragedies. How have your painful experience shaped you? Educational experiences, ministry experiences, experiences you've had in serving others. You see, all of these things, I I, I wonder if some people in this room, let, let me just tell you this. We have so many young people in this church that need Spiritual mums and dads, spiritual grandparents, spiritual big brothers and big sisters that don't need to have all the answers, but they can just come beside a young person. And when I say young person, I'm talking about young adults right down to teenagers and just say, let me tell you about what I went through when I was your age. Let me tell you about the fact that you're not alone. My brother went through this, whatever. Sometimes it is a crime to hold on to your experiences when there's someone sitting right next to you that is desperately craving someone to be able to identify with what they're going through. And sometimes the only thing that we have to do is to share our stories with one another. Now, there's times and places some of us are not ready to share all of our experiences, and I understand that. That's fine. But some of us are, and God has actually shaped you and your experiences to help other people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 to 4. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. This is a powerful verse. Do you know what it tells me? It tells me that in the same way that God has comforted some of you in this room, you are going to be able to point other people to Jesus and say, this is how Jesus comforted me. And you know what? It won't just be Jesus that comforts them. It'll be you that comfort them. Because God is in you. So, these are some of the things that are really important uh, to understanding our shape. And what we'll do is, if you do that spiritual gifts survey, and then when we sit down, we'll talk about, what are you passionate about? What are the key what are the key uh, formative experiences that you bring to the table that you might feel like you can use to help other people? And so we're just believing that as a church, we will we could often when we think about the lid on a church, you know, a lid that will prevent us from a better future. Uh, we often think about the early church as being this one of perpetual revival. But lately I've been reading through in Acts chapter 6, and the church in Acts chapter 6, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to dig into it because I'm running out of time. But the church in Acts chapter 6, there's this. it, it seems like the church was growing, but it hit a snag. And do you know what that snag was? 
the Christian leaders in the church were having division over caring for the poor and the needy. They were putting all of their time into distributing bread to widows and to orphans and to looking after. So, so the, the Hebrew women were being looked after, but the Gentile women weren't. And so it was causing division in the church, and it seemed like it was taking up the church leaders. So much of their time was in this ministry of giving out bread and social justice um, activities. And so the apostles said, we cannot do this anymore because it's preventing us from preaching the word, ministering, planning churches, all that sort of stuff. So they appointed seven people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And it said that they handed over the responsibility. And I believe as we as a church, not just one person, this is not about one person. This is about us corporately. In, in the early church, it was seven people. I wonder whether as seven people or maybe as 17 people or as 70 people in this church step up and say, I have been shaped to make a difference, not just to plug a hole. I've been shaped to make a difference. And as you step up, responsibility will be handed to you. And what that will actually do is that will free up other people to do what God has shaped them to do. And what it says in Acts chapter 6 is it said that because of this, because this responsibility had handed over to them, the apostles were able to attend, give attention to prayer and to ministry of the Word and those sorts of activities. And it says in verse 7 of Acts chapter 6, so the Word of God spread. And what that tells me is that there was something limiting the gospel going out in that church at that time, that there was something that was curtailing the revival fire of the church and it was that there was not enough people stepping up to take their place in accordance with their shape. And it said that so the word of God spread and it goes on to say uh, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, increased rapidly. Sometimes the solution to the next stage for a church is not, hey, there's people out there that need to come in. Sometimes just saying within our body here, there are people that need to take some things on according to their shape that will take the lid off this church. People with evangelistic gifts, people with administrative gifts, people with, dare I say, apostolic gifts. I want to finish with this. Can I have the keys up, please? I really felt to finish with this. When you do a, 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 a sermon on service, you could be sitting there thinking, okay, do I need to get more involved? Or do I feel guilty for not doing enough? Or do I just feel like I'm not good at anything? Or I don't know what it is. I've been serving for a while, but it's not really lighting my fire. And you're kind of just self-analyzing the what of service. And I really felt to finish with this, that in John chapter 13, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And I just felt, this is in the worship time, I just felt this. I felt like for some of us, we struggle to really enjoy the freedom of serving, not the reluctance of serving, the freedom of serving God and being used by Him. Because we are the very people that if Jesus was here, we would not want him to wash our feet. That if Jesus was to walk in physically into this room, we would push him away and we'd say, we don't want you to wash our feet. But we feel like in the same way that the disciples, they didn't want Jesus washing their feet because they thought, no, 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 we're not worthy of having you wash our feet. We feel uncomfortable. But actually, the key to understanding service is to understand that the, that. God in the flesh, Jesus, our Saviour, our Messiah, He served us and we could not add anything to it. It's like we're just sitting there and we're just thinking, this is so uncomfortable. I should be, I should be washing your feet, Jesus. And Jesus has said, stop complaining and allow me to wash your feet. And, and, and He says an interesting thing in John 13. He says, unless, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. <laughs> Someone that is part of Jesus understands that we need to be washed in a way we don't deserve, cleansed in a way that we could not earn. 
And it's from that position of being humbled by Jesus, of having Him wash and serve us, that we realise that any service that we give, it's not because, hey, I'm, I'm serving you so that I get back. It's actually saying, I am serving in a response to the God that has served and given everything for me. When He washed my feet, He got my heart, He got my life. And so now I get, I get to participate in His ministry. I get to serve in this area. I get to be a carer for my mum and dad. I get to look after my work colleagues in a way that shows that I love and value them. I get to do this because I have been washed by Jesus and I didn't deserve it. And now I get to, in some small way, participate in His life that is given to me. That is the foundation of service. Gratitude. Gratitude for what He has given to us already. Can we stand to our feet?